Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. Hello everyone and thanks for joining us on yet another edition of the program Views on the Continent on the Pan-African Television Africa Media. Today we want to talk again about uh, something very uh, crucial that is happening across Africa and particularly in Cameroon. Our focus is on uh, the Anglophone crisis, but this time around uh, we want to look at why uh, a peaceful revendication that uh, started some years ago has been engulfed by acts of uh, barbarism. We want to uh, uh, bring to light uh, the fact that uh, uh, the last Monday, uh, or the 6th of November, was not a good day uh, for the, uh, uh, the country Cameroon as uh, uh, the southwest region, particularly in Mamfi, uh, actually witnessed another act which uh, can be termed as heinous and a uh, gross uh, murder in uh, Mamfi with uh, civilians uh, being uh, trapped and killed. And uh, we uh, actually put that as an act of uh, barbarism. So we're asking the question of why uh, peaceful revendications have become, uh, have turned into something else or have been uh, engulfed by this act of barbarism and what is the way forward? Uh, how can uh, the Cameroon uh, government ensure uh, that uh, these uh, crises, of course, which seems uh, to be hijacked by some uh, uh, unscrupulous and uh, some people uh, that cannot actually be accounted for, it's uh, uh, bringing uh, the population to a point where we see uh, gruesome killings of people who are uh, civilians uh, to, to be uh, actually uh, precise. Uh, and uh, the uh, recent attack in uh, Mamfi brings again to the spotlight uh, the uh, the crisis which have been ongoing and uh, which uh, actually for some years and now uh, in the predominantly English uh, speaking regions of uh, the uh, country Cameroon. So what is the way forward? What can be done? How can we put uh, this uh, act of barbarism uh, to uh, at bay? And of course, uh, how can we ensure uh, that the diverse ideas Geologists, which have actually changed the perspective of uh, the uh, crisis which uh, uh, orchestrated uh, in 2016. Uh, how can we change the perspective? Because what we are seeing today is no longer what was in uh, 2016, 2017, uh, with uh, the genesis of uh, these uh, uh, revendications, which centered uh, around uh, a more political representation, uh, uh, the uh, the fact of uh, the, the the cultural representation, of course, of the English uh, speaking. Uh, 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 people or uh, regions of Cameroon and also on the aspect of marginalization. But when then uh, the presence takes uh, actually push us to ask questions of where Cameroon is heading as far as the crisis is concerned. Uh, to analyze uh, this with us, we have uh, Mr. Elijah Enroku, who is uh, joining us this day from Canada in his capacity as researcher with Leeds University on African Development, of course. Uh, is this the Africa we want? How can we have this Africa with uh, the insecurity that is still a problem, with acts of uh, barbarism which has engulfed uh, uh, peaceful revendications uh, uh, around Cameroon? It is uh, always a pleasure having you to share insight on topical issues like these, uh, uh, Mr. Elijah Inakur, and I take this opportunity to say welcome to you. Thank you very much, Clarice. I uh, appreciate being on your program one more time. Um, unfortunately, it's a sad day that we are here discussing about the loss of close to 50 people or so yeah. in the Anglophone region in Cameroon. Um, I wish we were not here to discuss such a thing. It's an unfortunate incident that shouldn't be happening in Cameroon or in Africa. And when there's loss of life, when there's loss of security, when there's loss of human capital, because that's what's going to develop Africa. When there's loss of human capital, mm -hmm. the whole country or the continent goes down. So this is an unfortunate incident. And um, I hope the leaders that be will be listening to us in some of the suggestions and discussions and some of the issues that we're going to be discussing in this program so that Cameroon and Africa as a whole can 
chart a new course forward. Because where there is no peace, Clarice, it doesn't matter how smart you are as the leader of a country. It doesn't matter who your international partners are. It doesn't matter the amount of World Bank loans or international loans that you're going to get to develop that country. Where there is no peace, where there is insecurity, where there is killing, where there is anarchy, that country cannot go ahead. Go all over the world. It doesn't matter. And look at a country that is still struggling with security issues, struggling with making sure that the finances and the budget of the country, instead of being channeled towards developmental projects, is being channeled to buy weapons. Because if you look at the budgets of these countries, Cameroon, Burkina Faso, uh, all these countries, can name anyone, you look at the percentage of their budget that is being spent on security, buying armed weapons, it will tell you that those countries are on the wrong footing in terms of development. So this is an unfortunate situation, and we hope that we can throw some light based on what we understand as people of this country, originally born, bred Cameroonians, we can discuss together and see what can be done to put an end to this barbarism and this chaos that's going on in this country. So thanks for having me. And it's always a pleasure, uh, dear Elijah in Rocco, to have you share your insight. Like I said, uh, today our topic is asking the question why a peaceful revendication has been engulfed by acts of barbarism where we see uh, the onslaught on civilians, like you rightly underlined, uh, Mr. Elijah, the human capital. This is a loss of human capital. And what are the effects of this on uh, the economy of Cameroon, on the peace of the nation, and what is the way forward? Uh, before actually uh, uh, looking at what is the way for, what the way forward is, let's understand uh, the uh, happening, the latest sad happenings around Amamfi in the southwest region. Uh, uh, what can you give about what happened? Because from uh, uh, actually uh, information circulating, you see uh, some of the people that survived, you saw them saying, uh, they heard things like, they are actually were identified, like their tribes were identified and called like, there was something that was agonized, like this was an agonized act. So what uh, analysis can you give to what happened recently in uh, Mamfi, the southwest region of Cameroon? Uh, Clarice, I want us to take a step back. First and foremost, what happened? I know that the government of the nation is still doing investigations. Uh, I know that a lot of people are coming out with some facts and so on. But while we wait for the facts, we can already analyze and say, it doesn't matter whether you will call yourself a separatist or a government soldier, or whoever you are, when death killing of the people that you are supposed to protect is concerned, you have lost course. You have lost your mind. You've lost consciousness of what you're supposed to do, whether you call yourself a separatist. If you believe that you are fighting for a people and you take arms and butcher those same people, then you are not fighting for them. You're fighting for yourself. You're fighting for something else. You are an enemy of the people. It doesn't matter who you call yourself whether separatists or I don't know, we don't have the facts right now, but every indication seems to be pointing to some acts of revenge from a separatist group or whatever it is, we don't have the facts yet. But the point here is that if you believe that you are fighting for the people and you believe that you have something to bring to the table to ameliorate the lifestyle of the people, or if it is social justice, or if it is political justice, or if it is economic justice, or it is community justice, or whatever it is, and you take the lives of the same people that you believe you're fighting for, you have lost your way. You've lost your way. Because these are the people you've purport to be fighting for. Then you come and destroy their lives and kill their lives and completely decimate the community. You are an enemy of the people. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. You are an enemy of the people. So these acts of barbarism should be condemned wholeheartedly. Whether you are a separatist, whether you call yourself a separatist, I don't know what you're separating for in the first place, or you call yourself a government soldier that is supposed to be protecting the people. These are acts of barbarism that needs to be condemned totally. You cannot take your arms and 
gone down innocent people because of some political grievances that you have or whatever it is you have against them. You cannot take your gun and point to the people. So to begin, I want us to put the foundation and the groundwork that these are acts of barbarism. Yes. There is no political justification. There is no economic justification. There is no tribal justification for such acts of barbarism to be meted on people who just want to leave. These people just want to leave. They're just going about their lives. Some of them have no political affiliations, for goodness sake. They do not belong to one party or the other. They just want to leave. They just want to leave their ordinary lives. And here, they get up one day in the morning, and their lives are gone. So again, we should condemn this with the last, with the, uh, the last drop of energy that we have. Now, in terms of what happened, we got some reports that some people thought, you know, they were being reported well as separatists. We don't know. We're just discussing. We don't know the facts. We don't want to send out facts there, not confirmatory. But we got a report that some people said they were being re reported to the government as separatists and their government was now attacking them. Though, so they wanted to revenge. We don't know if that is true or not. Please, ladies and gentlemen, people of the Northwest and the Southwest, we are brothers. These Enemy that we've brought among ourselves, we're calling some people black legs, calling some people white legs, some people brown legs, or whatever name they're giving them. It is a tool that the enemy is bringing among ourselves to kill and annihilate ourselves. Let us understand that more than 10,000 people, tens of thousands of people have been displaced. And the latest report that I saw from uh, Freedom Watch and other uh, organizations that are watching the issue in Cameroon says close to 7,000 people have been killed, both separatists, civilians, children, and the military as well. So these are people, human capital that we are losing. So if you take your gun and destroy and burn and maim and kill people that you are supposed to be protecting, again, as I said, the blood of the people is shouting from the ground against you because whatever aim you think you want to achieve you cannot achieve that aim on the blood of innocent people innocent children people who just want to go about their lives so in case of what happened again the investigations are still going on we will get the facts as to what happened but fingers are already pointed to certain quarters of the separatists for this evil act upon their own people their own people, for goodness sake. Who are you trying to protect? Who are you fighting for? If you believe you have the cause, if you believe that you're fighting for something, if at all there's something tangible you can prove that you're fighting for, then you take your gun on the same people that you seem to claim that you're fighting and kill them at the end of the day, who are you fighting for? That's the question you need to answer. Yes. Who are you fighting for? So again, Clarice, we don't want to give any justification whatsoever for the barbarism that took place in the Southwest, it is evil, and whoever did it need to look inside into their conscience and know that the blood children, innocent women, by and selling, people who just want to live their life, mm -hmm. is crying on the ground against you. And you shall have no peace until you repent that evil and people have the peace that they desire in order to live their lives. Because this is pure barbarism and this is pure evil and there's no justification whatsoever for it. In data, Mr. Elijah Inoko, there is no justification for the onslaught on uh, civilians, for the gruesome uh, murder of uh, civilians. Uh, Why analyzing, uh, actually I was listening keenly to you because when we look at the genesis of, of these, uh, these uh, uh, grievances or revendications uh, back then were well, late 2016 entering uh, uh, 2017, uh, uh, which can be marked as the, as the uh, uh, the the beginning of, of the the crisis, uh, we heard of things like uh, there was there was a need uh, for this uh, uh, more political representation uh, from the uh, anglophones. Uh, uh, we also have the, the aspect of marginalization, 
and then uh, perceived uh, discrimination. But then uh, let's come to, to reality, like let's look at what is happening on the ground. We see that from 2016 till now, there's a lot of uh, 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 diverse uh, ideologies surrounding the crisis. And uh, you can bear with me uh, that it has taken another dimension. And that's why we see uh, these are lost of, li uh, uh, lost of lives, of especially uh, the civilians. Uh, let's try to give it a logical interpretation or analysis as to why uh, the different ideologies presented by the so-called people who seem to, who are uh, said to, to be defending the cause have brought us to this part where we are today, where we see unscrupulous killing of civilians without justified reasons or even there is like you said there is no justification for an onslaught on the people yeah clarice thank you for the question i wanted to lay the groundwork mm -hmm. and condemn barbarism then we'll come to looking at the root cause of this problem and so that we can give solutions discuss and have ideas on what needs to be done let us take a step back clarice because I've always said on different TV stations in Cameroon and out of Cameroon that have been chance opportune to talk about this issue that mm -hmm. this issue did not start in 2016. I don't want people to make a mistake and think this issue started in 2016. Where am I going with this? I am going back to, re to let people understand that this is a colossal failure on the part of the government of this nation, Cameroon, in conflict resolution. We wouldn't have been here if the, path, the strategies of resolving conflict were actually taken into place. Let's take a step back. This issue did not start then. Right from the time of independence, when this happened, the two Cameroons came together. The Southern Cameroon and the East Cameroon, they came together and they formed a nation. Nothing wrong with that. Countries all over the world do that all, all the time. But as time went on, there were wranglings within the nation of Cameroon as to how that unification, how that union is being handled. Let me take a step back. We realized that one of the architects of this union was Dr. John Gu Foncha. But what happened? Dr. John Gu Foncha, he resigned. If you look at the letter of the uh, resignation of Dr. John Gu Foncha, he listed a couple of things and said, things are not going well according to what we have planned and agreed on in terms of this country becoming one and moving forward as brothers and sisters. He listed a couple of things. He listed the annihilation, complete annihilation of the Anglophone heritage. He said the people were complaining that their own way of life, their culture, their heritage, their education, their, their system, their law and everything has been annihilated, assimilated into the Francophone system. Mr. President, let us look into this issue because it's going to bring problem. What happened? He was ignored and he resigned. You looked at Muna himself when he turned, when he came down from the consult council. He mentioned a couple of things that are going wrong within the Anglophone community within a Cameroon system. He was ignored. It boiled down in the 1990s that the SCNC, the SCNC came up because of the result of this same issue that we've been talking about. The SCNC, they, their propaganda was, the force of argument is not the argument of force. That's to say, we're not taking out arms. We are discussing and we are telling you, the government, the problems that are happening in this country. Let us resolve this country. They brought a couple of uh, proposals. Instead of looking at it, the government turned it a, a deaf eye. And most of those leaders of the SCNC, they fled away. We know about Ambassador Henry Foster, uh, Chief Ayamba. We know about all these people. Mm -hmm. And not only when they came together, AAC1, they came out with a preamble and said, the AAC1 is what we call the All Anglophone Conference. Most of us were still young back then, but we followed the events. The All Anglophone Conference, where late uh, uh, um, Cardinal Toomey was the champion. Even late uh, uh, Ni John Fruit, one of the champions, and all the other leaders, they were all together. They came out with a preamble and said, Mr. President and our brothers from East Cameroon, there is a problem in this country. The Anglophone education, way of life, culture, heritage has been assimilated and people are complaining. This is not what we agreed on to come together as a nation. They were ignored. 
The AAC2 came out. That is when rumblings of secession started at the AAC2. Rumblings of secession, but right from the onset, nobody, as far as I understand, when I was in the university, I was following these events, even though I was not politically inclined, but I knew these events. We followed these events. Before then, there were no rumblings of secession in Cameroon. People just wanted the nation to move forward and everybody to make sure that they feel a sense of belonging and their own way of life. You are not going to deny that Cameroon has two heritage. The French heritage that were inherited from the French people, I mean the Francophone heritage, and the Anglophone heritage that were inherited from the British. There is no gain saying, nobody's going to play politics around this. We are bound to live with this heritage. We are not going back to the before colonization heritage. This is what we inherited and this is what we're going to live with. And the two sides must be respected as having those identities within a common Cameroon and for the country to move forward. So when these entities, when this AAC1, AAC2 failed, that is where the rumblings of secession started in Cameroon. The teachers' grievances of 2016 is just an offshoot of the consortium that picked over from AAC1 and AAC2. So again, what am I saying? This is a colossal failure on the part of the government in terms of internal conflict resolution. If these things were resolved and people came to the table, now somebody listening to me is going to say, oh, the government came up with the, um, the national dialogue, whatsoever it is. You and I, sitting here with all honesty, will say that that wasn't a dialogue. That was a monologue. Because the people that were fighting there in the bush were not on the table. You invited a group of CPDM allies and some other one and bring them on the table. You cannot call that a dialogue. That is a monologue. That is why the problem still persists till today, Larish. Oh, of course, uh, uh, Mr. Alleger, you, you seem to have, been, of course, uh, highlighted the lapses of the government of Cameroon. Uh, but let's bring us to where we are now without actually forgetting the genesis of this, how it uh, uh, came about. And but the issue, our, our, our focal point this time, let's look at what is happening. Can we say, can we relate it to, uh, let me call it in court, a bad politics? in uh, Cameroon or among politicians who seem to be actually benefiting from what is happening in Cameroon now as far as the Anglophone crisis is concerned? Is it their uh, bad political manoeuvre that has brought us to this particular uh, instance where we see, where we talk of acts of barbarism? Will killing civilians actually grant whatsoever that they are revendicating? Isn't it uh, derailing uh, the, uh, actually the energy that the government has to put in maybe solving some of these uh, uh, grievances into seeing how they can actually tackle this act of uh, barbarism brought about by, I, I don't know, maybe it's is some uh, misplaced uh, ideologies from a political elites for their political gains? Let me put it to you on two sides. When you talk about misplaced priorities, you are 100% correct and political maneuvering, both from the side of the separatists. We have seen what the separatists are doing. We've seen people using these crises for their political agenda and their political gains. We've seen that. On, on the side of the government, we've seen people that have gone to Yaoundé and said that the problem is solved. And go back there, when they are sent back there, they go in bulletproof cash, they go there well protected if the problem is solved. Why wouldn't you go there and talk to the people and eat with the people like any other person if the problem has been solved? You go there and pull a bulletproof cash, you go back to Yaoundé and say, oh, the problem has been resolved and people are dying every day. Let me put it to you this way, Clarice. If the government of Cameroon, for instance, will take every elite from Yaoundé, government ministers, politicians, or whatnot, and say, go back to your division of origin. Those who come from the Northwest and Southwest, make sure that there is peace among your people before you come back here. I am telling you that this problem will be resolved more because those people, they're sitting down there, they are protecting their interest. We've seen cases where 
report has come out that people are actually benefiting from these from contracts, military contracts and all whatnot, supplying uh, food and money and ammunition and all what. We've seen those cases. Reports have come out. We don't want to be uh, pointing cases on, on TV. And on the part of the separatists as well, we've seen them be fat. We've seen them display properties all over television because they are benefiting from the crisis, from the blood of the people. So yes, there is polit political maneuvering that is happening on both sides of this crisis. Let us not kid ourselves and say, oh yeah, the separatists are only eating fat, but the government people, we know what is going on. People are manipulating the crisis to their own benefits. Because you will not tell me that there is a dialogue that is supposed to take place between those who are fighting and the government. And then you have the government selecting a cream of political hijackers and having a dialogue with them. And the people that are fighting in the bush, none of them is on the table. And you tell me that's a dialogue? No, that's a monologue. That is not honesty in resolving the problem. And that's why people continue to die. Because right now, politicians seem to be telling the government that the problem is over. The problem is solved. Okay, this peace and all. We saw politicians say, even on TV, that there's already peace in the Northwest and Southwest. We've achieved peace. Clarice, those are some of the shoes that Anglophones in this country are wearing. If you were to conduct a survey and ask every single Anglophone from the least to the earliest, they will tell us they feel abandoned in this country. They feel like they do not belong anymore. They feel like they have just been abandoning themselves to kill themselves, to destroy themselves, and nobody seems to care. I am telling you that the generation of Anglophones, I'm praying for peace in this country, but what the government and both the separatists are raising, raising children that are going to grow up tomorrow without an education, children that have no future, children that have no hope, societies that have been abandoned in the bush. You go to the Northwest and Southwest, villages that were becoming, you know, they were growing up so fast, they have become black bushes because nobody's going there because of war. But these same people, they go to Yaoundé and tell the government in Yaoundé that there is peace in the Northwest, everything is good and fine, we can go ahead with our lives. And the people on the ground that are suffering every day until an incident like this happens. Who was talking about this problem in Northwest and Southwest? How many TV stations and people were talking about this issue? When we kill people like this, that's why all of us will come on TV and say, oh, 50 people have been killed. But the people on the ground, they are passing through hell every single day. It is only when people are killed that we come on TV and all of us cry about it, or oh, people have died, but people have been shot and killed every single day. And we don't carry on TV. That is what I'm saying, that the people who are in government and separatists who are manipulating this crisis know what they are doing, but it's the ordinary Cameroonian from the Northwest and Southwest that's feeling this pinch. That's why we're here today, Mr. Elijah in Waku, to try to understand uh, deeper the crisis and see how can we can solve uh, this uh, actually uh, without actually uh, bringing a uh, uh, more negative effect uh, on uh, the uh, population, especially uh, the civilians are uh, joining us uh, once more uh, to uh, also give insight uh, to this uh, topic for discussion. Does they, it's uh, Mr. Shune Nguar who is joining in his capacity as a consultant and also a political commentator. It's always a pleasure having you and welcome to this edition of the program, sir. Good afternoon, Clarice. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Cameroon, and good afternoon, Africa. It's incumbent on me as a political pundit to come here to clarify and edify public opinion on things happening in Cameroon, our continent, Africa, and why not the world. I'm once more delighted to be here. It's always a pleasure, of course. Uh, we want to engage in this uh, thought-provoking uh, program and looking at how we can solve all the problems which have engulfed uh, Cameroon, especially the English-speaking uh, regions of the country. And okay. we're asking the question today, why uh, what started uh, as a peaceful revendication has been engulfed by acts of barbarism. We're taking an example of what uh, happened on the 6th of November 2023, where we saw the onslaught in uh, Mamfi. 
Yes, uh, Clarice, with your permission, before I speak, I would love that we have just 10 seconds of silence in order of our compatriots who were brutally murdered by barbarians in Murphy. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, I'm deeply touched by what happened in Manfi, where we saw innocent citizens of this country brutally murdered in cold blood by gruesome barbarians in the name of separatist fighters, fighting for an illusion nation that exists nowhere and I begin to wonder in which wilderness that kind of nation will come to be. Because if by error or by design, that kind of nation comes to existence, with whom and with who are they going to work in diplomacy? That's a question. In a nation where autocracy, blood and murder is the order of the day. I think we are all conversing for democracy. Indeed. That is a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. And where there is freedom of speech, freedom of opinion, and freedom of association. <clears throat> this purported Ambazonian government, with their Ambazonian defense forces, who have that very strong opinion that Anybody who stands against their idea, opinion, is standing against their ideology, is considered a black leg, and should be murdered in cold blood. As a matter of fact, it is unacceptable. I want to add my voice to that of the government of this country to say that, contrary to what warmongers are preaching, the government of this country has done everything to the best of its capacity to bring peace, unity, tranquility in the Anglophone regions. Before I continue in my analysis, yeah. it is unfortunate that I met Mr. Elaju in Marco giving his analysis, and I think that I have some strong words as opposed to what he was saying. I, from his eloquence, I know he is an intellectual, Absolutely. but unfortunately I saw an intellectual exhibiting intellectual dishonesty. Frankly speaking, <coughs> frankly speaking, a government has that mandate to oversee the well-being of its citizens. And I think that it falls within the fundamental principles and responsibilities of the government of Cameroon to protect its citizens. And that is what they have been doing. And as an answer to the Anglophone crisis, His Excellency Paul Bia, President of the Republic and Head of State, called for a grand national dialogue. This grand national dialogue was attended by senior citizens of this country and representatives of those who were fighting for separation or secession and federalist. Because when he speaks, it gives the impression that all the Anglophone Cameroonians want to secede. From the perspective on the ground, you have federalists, you have nationalists, and you have separatists. And all these three groups were represented in the national dialogue. But those who have decided to take the barrel of the guns in their hands are the purported separatists who fall within the minority. And I think that you cannot use blood, you cannot use killings to intimidate a government to cede to your demand. These are political deci decisions that have to be taken by the electorate of this country. 
I think that they need to create a political platform where they can put their revendications and see how it can be put forward. Instead of using maiming, barbarism, murder, and all forms of intimidation, they think they can put their point through. Uh, uh, without actually interrupting now, uh, Mr. Shunei, well, before you, you joined, we were looking at uh, uh, those uh, factors of forces uh, that are making whatever thing you've said uh, not a reality in uh, the government's uh, quest to put an end uh, to the uh, crisis uh, rocking predominantly uh, English-speaking regions. So uh, I brought for the, the aspect of this different, you quite mentioned uh, different groups of people, uh, those of uh, nationalists, uh, federalists, and uh, separatists. And of course, I'm looking at how these differences uh, shared by these uh, different groups and their ideologies have brought us to where we are today. That makes it very difficult for the government of President Paul Bia to bring a, a, a lasting, a, a practical solution uh, to the problem at stake at this particular moment. Yes, Clarice. Uh Without any fear of contradiction, I think uh, a lasting solution has been sought out for this problem. But today, uh, we still see uh, this act of barbarism, and that is what is worrisome. The act of how barbarism we, is being carried out. How can out, we contend this? The act of barbarism is being carried out by a group of terrorists who think that they can use warfare to put their agenda through. Let me expand further on that. Yes, you, you, right Let me expand it further on that. You would bear with me that this crisis that started in early twenty, in late 2016, yeah, and uh, <coughs> became a quagmire from 2017 up to now, mm -hmm. was a lawyers and teachers strike revendication, sure. where the teachers were asking for more rights. The lawyers requested for the Ohada law to be translated into French. And then uh, the consortium, the Anglophone consortium, came up to put forward their agenda towards the government putting in regulations that will curb down on what they considered as a marginalization on Anglophones. There were 21 points. There were 21 points that were put forward. I think that the government of this conf country, in all magnanimity and clairvoyance, responded responded to about 19 of all these points that were put through, Absolutely. except that of separation or federalism. And the, the lawyers and the teachers who orchestrated these manifestations yeah. are all tranquil now in their trade, doing their business as sure as, as before, and, that's uh, and, the working, actually and working in conformity and collaboration with the government of this country. It served as if the revendications of the lawyers and those of the teachers serve as a platform for terrorists to come and use it to put their agenda through. Because, as you rightly said in your caption, peaceful uh, revendications engulfed by acts of barbarism. What analysis? The analysis is that you have people of a gentleman's profession, the lawyers, and noble profession, the teachers, requested for improvements <coughs> in their working conditions, and the government ceded to it. But terrorists came and hijacked the platform and now took the agenda to their side mm -hmm. to put their whimsical intentions forward. But we are in a state of law, Cameroon is a state of law, and we respect and we have ratified all human rights <coughs> treaties. But we are saying, and I am saying here, that it is clear in that time is coming with all the acts that they are proving that they are causing war crimes against humanity mm -hmm. and they will be brought to book sooner than later. Uh, before continuing with Mr. Elijah, let me just uh, ask this uh, question that will correlate uh, the, the, the previous you just answered. You are very uh, keen and categorical about uh, uh, the role of the government uh, that has been very practical in solving the crisis. 
But then we, we, we are very much aware uh, that uh, due to, uh, I don't know, political rhetoric or political maneuvering that is happening across the country, that's one of the reasons why we see uh, some of all of these things, uh, some of these things happening, this act of uh, barbarism uh, for political gain. So how can we or the government of Cameroon work to uh, actually root out these uh, uh, people with uh, low political uh, uh, ideologies or maybe philosophies, which actually is uh, the reason why we're at this stage, at this particular moment, because uh, from reports and from what some, some people have been saying, uh, some uh, politicians, uh, this not on me, uh, I beg your pardon, we're just uh, saying according to some reports we have had, uh, the, 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 the behavior or the immature nature of some politicians in the, the country can account or justify for why we still have these uh, uh, acts of barbarism at this particular juncture of the crisis in spite of the efforts of the President of the Republic to put an end to it. Uh, yes, uh, Clarice, but those are rhetorics of warmongers and political dictators who are looking for any means at their disposal to uh, undermine the efforts that the government of this country has been putting in place to make sure that normalcy returns to the Northwest and Southwest regions. I want to take you some memory lane behind Clarice that I, we, we hosted a lot of programs here between 2015, 2016, 2017 yes. at the beginning of this crisis Absolutely. where I stood firm and I put my points forward and uh, I was totally against what was happening. I was not in favor of the government of this country because uh, when you are a political pundit and you criticize somebody and the person acts in favor of what you have said, it becomes incumbent on you to appreciate the efforts of the person. Absolutely. It is not like when you are in the opposition, you remain an eternal opposer. Whether good or bad is done, you only continuously, you continuously continue to for f put poor criticisms on the person. I think that I was one of the few uh, <coughs> uh, political pundits who have that strong affiliation to the government of rigor and moralization, mm -hmm. who sat here in this plateau and said, no, this issue of Anglophones is genuine. And I think the government has to do something to make sure Anglophones live freely in this country with their Francophobias as a unity state as propagated by the head of state in his policy of rigor and moralization when he took over this country 41 years ago. True to tradition, His Excellency Paul Bia in whose clairvoyance I trust reacted and I believe that he was listening to us, if not his advisors listened to us and consulted him and he called for the Grand National Dialogue. And the Grand National Dialogue came and responded to 90% of the demands of the consortium that was representing the Anglophone population in this country. Except for that too, that there will not be a federalism and there will not be separation. Yeah. The lawyers have gone back to their courts they are exercising their profession in all honor and dignity. The teachers are back in their classrooms, except of a few weeks or months ago that they came out with new revendications, without which I think the government in its bona fide role of protecting and promoting citizens and their property, they are playing their role. The head of state called for a grand national dialogue. I begin to wonder, how do you expect these voices in the bushes, I think we all know them. They are notorious thieves who have been disturbing us in our neighborhoods in the Northwest and Southwest region. And when this crisis began, some on, of, of our unscrupulous brothers who are living in Europe and America used them to hijack a genuine and intellectual revendication. 
and transform it to a barbaric revolution. And now even those who brought them to the lamb light who are in Europe are unable to remove them back in the bushes. So I want to tell you that what is actually transpiring now in the Northwest and South regions, that is the public killings, is the last kick of a dying horse to show that they have missed their agenda because they are now targeting, targeting the people they purportedly want to protect and save. So it shows that they have missed their agenda and it gives credibility to the government of this country that they are succeeding in their mission of protecting, promoting national unity and integrity. Okay. okay. And integration. Okay, thank you so much uh, for the analysis, Mr. Uh, Shune. Coming uh, back to you, uh, Mr. Elijah Enokua, have uh, analyzed uh, so far uh, some of uh, the factors uh, which have uh, led uh, to uh, the uh, crisis, uh, Anglophone crisis. We want to continue to look at how uh, these actually have uh, opened uh, uh, Cameroon. Uh, we look at the, the in external influence. Uh, let's look at it. Why is it difficult for for uh, the government of Cameroon and the, uh, uh, the so-called uh, uh, separatist uh, fighters uh, to come to a compromise. At one moment, uh, we want to ask because uh, we cannot def uh, deny the, the fact uh, that a lot is happening at the global world and even in uh, Cameroon is not uh, left out. So let's look at the role, especially of, of the uh, international uh, uh, community in solving uh, this uh, crisis and also look at uh, the uh, is there a possibility of an external influence in uh, what is happening presently in uh, Cameroon actually we know how politics works do you think uh, there is some sort of external influence and if yes how can we tackle this Clarice, before I answer your question, I want to respond to something Mr. Shone said. It's somebody I know we've met on different platforms. Okay. I know he's a member of the political party in power and Cameroon is a democratic country and has the right to say whatever he wants to say. We have rights to our opinion, but we do not have the right to the facts. The facts remain the facts and they're on the ground. Number one, before the national dialogue was called, members of his government and others, they said there were no problems. People were dying, children were killed, houses were burnt, individuals were going on the streets hungry, children had no school and all whatnot. Those same people said there was no problem, the government had resolved the issue. Then there was a national dialogue. The same people are saying the di national dialogue has come and resolved the issue. Therefore, the, there's no problem. Listen, gentlemen, if you do not take out the force of the argument that is ravaging the community in the Anglophone area. And you are not honest to see that the life of one individual, whether a military or a civilian, it's important, you are not honest. We do not need 50 people to be burnt and killed by separatists for us to come on TV to understand that it's a problem. The reason this thing has fiddled on the ground is because of the propaganda like this one that says the problem in the Northwest and the South has been resolved. Therefore, no issue, the government should not bother about it. That is the propaganda that these political pundits are taking to Yaoundé and our people continue to die. Number two, we have all condemned the barbarism of the separatists in the Northwest and the Southwest. No, there is no gain saying about that. There is no debate about that. But talk about the political ideology that brought us this problem, Mr. Shone. Talk about the issues that caused this problem. Let us be honest to ourselves and see the lives of our people as human lives. You are from the Northwest. You know when you are growing up, you know the pitch. You feel the truth that you and I, we grew up, understanding the problems that we went through. Have those problems been resolved? And says no. You do not need to listen, gentlemen and ladies and gentlemen that are listening to me. I have said, even he himself, Mr. Shoney on, on students already said that the issue was hijacked by these separatist monsters. But the issue still remains. The problem still remains. 
Let's take out the separatists from this equation. Do you think that the revivification of the people of the Northwest and Southwest has been resolved? People in different political parties, with the exception of the CPDM, have said the form of state in Cameroon needs to be looked into. And we need to come together and agree on how this country needs to be governed. This is not a separatist issue. This is not an issue of those monsters in the bush. It's an issue of any ordinary Cameroonian from the Northwest and the Southwest. So ladies and gentlemen, I hate political propaganda. I love truth. Let's understand that there is a problem that needs to be resolved. And number two, I am not a member of any organization or any consortium or whatever, but the facts remain the facts. The consortium did not ask for a separation. Please do not misrepresent facts. They asked for a reorganization of the form of state. You could call it federalism. Some say federation, others say confederation, others, it doesn't matter, but it should be discussed. It should be brought on the table and let people understand how is this country going to be governed? How do we make sure that the Anglophones do not feel marginalized? How do we make sure that their heritage does not feel assimilated and completely annihilated? How do we make sure that these people feel like Cameroonians? That is the issue we are talking about here. And anybody that brings political propaganda into the equation is dishonest, completely dishonest. And these are the people that are causing the problem because they do not want to accept reality until lives have been wasted. We know it. Before the, before the National Conference was called, these people were saying the same thing. All that said, there was no Anglophone problem. All that said, all kinds of things. When people start getting killed, and then the international community started raise, rising up, and that's when people say, oh, no, let's sit down and discuss this. Gentlemen and ladies and gentlemen, everyone listening to me, we are all Africans. We can learn example from some African countries. I want to give you the case of Ethiopia, which I have studied at length. The Tigrin people in the north, they had a similar problem than what we have in the northwest and the southwest. They picked up arms against the government because of the same sort of marginalization. The government had the upper hand to completely, completely annihilate and squash them up. But the government said, these are our brothers. They have a revendication. Well, let's bring them to the table. The government decided to lay down his hand and call these people for a discussion in South Africa. And that is how peace came back to Ethiopia. It is not because the government did not have the power to completely destroy them. The government saw that that is not the way to handle a nation. You bring the people and look at the ideology on which they hold on and take out that ideology from them and bring a solution to that problem. That is how you solve internal conflict within a country. You do not go with the battle of the gun. It's not going to solve this problem. The government can kill all the separatists. You will not kill the ideology and the problem that brought this problem. There was no separatists when the SCNC was there. There was no separatists in, terms, in the days of AC1 AC, AAC. There was no separatists when Muna spoke. There was no separatists when Fon Charles spoke. Even John Frulli spoke. There was no separatists. So let us not hang on these monsters and barbaric people that are killing people and say, oh, they are the cause of the problem. These problems existed before these guys hijacked the whole thing. Let us go back to the table. Cardinal Tumi spoke about it. Neil John Frunny spoke about it. A lot of politicians are speaking about it. The CRM is speaking about it. Politicians in government of goodwill are speaking about it. Until you recognize the issue and bring it to the table, ladies and gentlemen, our people are going to continue to lose their lives. Because when you take out the problem, you take out what they are revendicating, you bring it to the table. That is how you take out the force of argument. When you take out the force of argument from the people, there is no point the separatists themselves will lose relevance. I'm telling you this. Because the separatists are using the sentiments of the people, hijacking it in order to foster the agenda. But when you take it away from them, you take away the argument which they're arguing on, and then you bring it on the table and discussing, separatists will lose their relevance, ladies and gentlemen. So let us be honest to ourselves and to the lives of our people. And number three, if you are a good governance person, you will understand that a government that spends close to 40% of its budget on military ammunition because they want to maintain peace in that country will not survive. That is not a government of the people. A government of the people is the government that completely make sure that they prioritize the aspiration of the people and not use the budget 40 or 30 to 5, 25% to buy ammunition in order to maintain itself. That is not governance. So again, 
Let us make sure that we are honest with our people and honest with the lives of the people and not play political propaganda over the lives of people. That's where we end. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Inoku. Thank you for that. Uh, coming back to you, uh, Mr. Shine, at this particular moment, we'll be looking at uh, the uh, strategies uh, that uh, the government, you know, the, uh, it's often said uh, that uh, only the government has uh, an upper hand to solving uh, the, the crisis, uh, rocking uh, the uh, predominantly speak, uh, English speaking regions of the, the country. So we want to look at uh, the uh, 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 strategies, be it political, economic, or social strategies uh, that the co government uh, can employ uh, to promote uh, this uh, actually uh, dialogue and understanding and uh, which will bring about a reconciliation and uh, compromise uh, between uh, the uh, uh, Cameroons of uh, the, uh, the English expression and those of uh, Cameroonians of the French uh, expression and of course uh, to ensure that uh, a unified uh, nation. So what are those strategies? I think that, uh, Clarice, to the best of my understanding and practically seeing what the government of this country has been doing, we know on easy lies ahead that wears the crown. President Bia, in all his clairvoyance, after the Grand National Dialogue, which I earlier said that is a continuous process, has proceeded with peacekeeping. Because what the Republican military of this country that I owe a lot of respect is doing is that they are on a peacekeeping mission in the Northwest and Southwest regions. They are not at war. And uh, within the peacekeeping mission, as instructed by the head of state, His Excellency Paul Bia, we see that most of our brothers in the southwest and northwest regions who were drowned into this fallacious dream of a Facebook republic called Ambazonia have gradually come back to reason to see that it is a dream that will never come true. So they are now collaborating with our republican forces and you see that the crisis is gradually ending and we are gradually getting to normalcy. But true to tradition, uh, with our unscrupulous brothers who are hanging in the West, they don't want to accept that their agenda has failed. So once in a while they mobilize these voices that we know, and we know that they used to be the hoodlums of our communities, and they have now taken arms and hiding in the bushes in the name of separatist fighters, without even understanding the agenda of separation. They will manipulate them to come out and do one or two sporadic attacks, so that people should not think that the issue has come to an end. Uh, as opposed to what uh, my comrade and compatriot, Mr. Anwaku, said, I want to say that when I look at him, I see he's a man of my generation. And when we were growing up, uh, when the NCAC was still operating under back doors, we all grew up knowing the slogan that the force of argument are not the argument of force. Samuel and his team. And that has always been the Anglo-Saxon spirit that animated us as youths when we were going around. And when we confronted our Francophone brothers, they used to call us, I know my right. I know my right. We were instructed by legendary politicians of blessed memory like Sam Mufo and uh, uh, this man of NCNC, how do they used to call him? Today, where is the force of argument? Where has it gone to? Anglophones were respected for the force of argument and not the argument of force. But today, the tables have turned. We have a secessionist group masterminded by the Ambazonian Defense Forces of uh, Cho Ayaba, who have implanted the argument of force and not the force of argument. If you dare think against the principles and modalities of the SDF, of the ADF, you are murdered in cold blood. This is what we are talking about. 
And I must remind Mr. Onwako and all our fellow viewers that the Grand National Dialogue was not a static process, it is a continuous process. All committees were formed and they are doing con they are consultative bodies that are working actually as we are talking now live in this studio. And reports are being sent to the head of to, to the head of government, which are all forwarded to the head of state. And I think further modifications and implementations are being recorded as the days go ahead. So we are saying that a process of dialogue has been instituted. Let us as Republicans and people who respect the principles of democracy and good, good governance adhere to what the government of this country, through the clear violence of the head of state, His Excellency Paul Bia, have decided. It is not by continuously killing our own that we are going to put our agenda on the international stage. You ask a question to Mr. Anuako that he tactically evaded it. What is the international community doing in terms of coming in? The international community has shown beyond all reasonable doubt that they are on the side of the government of this country. We have had the Secretary General of the Commonwealth come here. We had the Secretary General of the Francophonie come here. We had the, the Secretary General of the United Nations representative come here. The dialogue with the government of this country and most often than not, all the time, we we'll have uh, Southern Cameroonians residing in, the Euro in Europe or in the United States of America go in front of European Union headquarters and the UN to strike, and they have never been listened to because they have taken the path of murder. They have taken the wrong path, and those institutions do not represent those type of ideals. So on no grounds, wherever or however, would they ever come to collaborate or support the barbaric ideologies of those who stand for Ambazonia. Ambazonia has been blacklisted at the international level. It shall never come to be. What I think and believe and confirm is that let us come back to Cameroonians as lofty nationals of this beloved triangle. Collaborate and concur with the government in the continuous process of the Grand National Dialogue. Send in our points. We we'll write to the Prime Minister. Send in our points and the various committees that were set up will continue their process of consultation and proposals will be considered and the situation of our nation will be improved upon because whether we like it or we don't like it, Cameroon is one and indivisible. And we are in a state of law and the government will do everything to the best of its capa capacity to protect the territorial integrity of this nation, protect its citizens and their properties, for that is their role and responsibility and they will not be tamed by any acts of barbarism to weaken their strength. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Shune. Uh, you were talking earlier on. Uh, thank you for that, Mr. Shune. While talking earlier on, you made mention of something which I want us to to, to dwell on because uh, uh, I think uh, it's one uh, uh, factor that has actually brought us to this state of uh, barbarism, uh, maybe uh, in the, to, to an extent. Mm -hmm. You talked about uh, different uh, uh, political parties, uh, the opposition, uh, uh, if you remember what you said, like the opposition should not only oppose the ideologies of the ruling party, but should sometimes come to a compromise when they see that the ruling party is actually uh, taking uh, decisions which are actually in favor of the, the civilians. And I, I think uh, uh, this brings us again uh, to the uh, aspect of political maturity and how we can use political maturity in Cameroon to solve uh, this problem and also uh, put an end uh, to uh, the uh, to the crisis. You quite mentioned uh, uh, some uh, Cameroonians who are uh, maybe in the West or other countries uh, actually uh, uh, sponsoring a visa uh, 
uh, the so-called separatists and, and actually uh, uh, preaching their ideologies to them. But then you fail to mention the, the politicians who are actually in the country and actually sending for the, some of their ideologies to these uh, same separatists for their own political gain. So uh, let's, let's be very categorical because at the end we want to see that uh, uh, focal point or that point of compromise where we can now live from there towards ensuring uh, that we solve these problems without much ambiguity. What can be done to, to, to the political elites? To the political elite because the head of state actually uh, is not the one going on, on this pe uh, peace uh, missions or uh, orchestrating or uh, masterminding all of this. He can only give a decree but then his subordinates, his ministers, and other politicians who are on the field, how have they helped to solve this problem? Are they mind the problem or are they solving the problem? And if they are uh, involved in these uh, reasons why we still have acts of barbarism, what can be done practically? The, the, the issue or the battle line here is all seeing that this ends because it's monthly today, tomorrow we can hear another one. And it's because of these ideologies. You know, when as a child, when information is being put in mind, like act this way you act, how can we use, uh, uh, describe bad politics that has brought us to this end? Yes, uh, Clarice, thank you for that very, very important question. It goes without any gain saying that we have some unorthodox opposition politicians in this country who want to use any unorthodox means to ascend to, to power. And after having failed in their political agenda to ascend to power through the ballot box, they think they, think they can use the Anglophone crisis as a bridge to destabilize this country and gain access to power. We know them, and they know themselves, and they are listening to me. And then in terms of political maturity, we have people like the late John Fundy, former chairman of the SDF, who faced persecution from his own Anglophone brothers because he took the path of truth, because he took the noble path and he was considered as a black leg. Even when he transited, he died, and he was given a state burial by the head of state of this country, they went forward to go and burn down his compound and still tacked him as a black leg. This is a politician that manifested maturity. Indeed. He showed that his political vision and mission was to make Cameroon a united and integrated nation to enjoy the fruits of their motherland. But as I always say, you have the unscrupulous political pundits who are waiting for the least strike of the match so that they can pour fuel and let the places burn and let them take advantage to meet their hidden agenda. Mr. Bia, as I would always say, I trust in his clairvoyance, has proven that he remains that father, that mature politician who stands to the ideals and vision of his political manifesto of rigor and moralization. Let me tell you, let me take you memory lane behind. During the political upheavals of the 90s, when the entire nation of Cameroon was clamoring for multipartism, politicians of my political descent came out in rallies and said that Cameroon does not need multipartism. But you know what? The visionary Paul Bia took them by surprise and granted multipartism. Let me take you fast forward. Yeah. In late 2016 and 17, when the Anglophone lawyers and the teachers start clamoring for the upgrading of their rights, 
some politicians of the same political inclination where I belong and the head of state came out and said there was no anglophone problem but true to tradition and the clear violence of Mr. Bia he came out in Mondo vision and announced to the national and international community that there was an anglophone that there is an anglophone problem and he is going to do everything to resolve this anglophone problem how can you respect a man of integrity that's a man who has shown proof of his magnanimity as the head of state so i am of the very strong opinion that if Cameroonians of the Anglophone descent have ever thought that they were marginalized, the head of state acknowledged that they were and that he is going to find, find solutions to this problem of which he has done and he is in the continuous process of doing. Without which, look at what Anglophones are going through. From 20. 16 to 2023 if Cameroonians of the Anglophone descent have built 500,000 houses for the past seven years 450,000 of those houses have been built in the French region I said since independence if Camer Ang Cameroonians of the Anglophone descent have been living in francophone regions in their thousands they now live in the francophone regions in their millions i want to say that if anglophones were proud in this country it is because of their educational system that was of an advanced status Oh, and francophones of the other eight regions, those who were where to do, sent their children to study in our institutions, the Sasses, the Kas Bambilis, the CPC Balis, the uh, Okoyong, and you can name the rest. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you, all those institutions have been transferred to the francophone zones. So if we claimed that they marginalize us we have intentionally marginalized ourselves now because we have transferred and we are living with them how can you move into somebody's house and turn around and claim the person is your enemy we are talking from douala i have been living in douala for over 25 years though i've been having some sporadic hangovers in europe and other continents but i think here we live in peace and tranquility I think in Bamenda 1 council, Bamenda 2, 3, 4, 5 councils, a francophone has never ever been a mayor or a first deputy, third, fourth, or fifth mayor. But let me tell you, here in Douala, we have been having anglophones who are mayors in Bonaberry, in bon the Douala 4 council, Douala 5 council, even our brother Joshua Osi is a, is a parliamentarian for Douala One Council. It cannot happen in the Anglophone region. So to tell you that if we talk of marginalization is a fallacy. Even though the head of state agreed on it, but if you look so very well. Maybe marginalization in marginalization other aspects. Marginalization in other aspects. So. We should understand that God created this country as one and indivisible. Let me tell you. Let me tell you, look at the geographical setting of this country. When we claim that we are Anglophones, the Bakweriman in the Southwest region speaks the same language with the Douala people who are just 15 minutes drive from Boya to Bonaberry. Look at the Babachu people in the West region. They speak the same language with the Bafut people, which is just 30 minutes drive from Babaju to Bafut. How can you want to divide God's people? If we want to divide on cultural links and cultural and traditional backgrounds, the Southwest people will be joining the Litura region and the Bamileke people will be joining us in the Northwest region. 
So it is practically impossible to have an ambassador republic. That is my case. Uh, thank you for that, uh, of course, uh, Mr. Shune Ngwa. Uh, coming now uh, back to you for a concluding uh, statement, uh, Mr. Elijah Enoku. Uh, I always uh, admire when we engage in a thought-provoking uh, analysis uh, of topical issues, especially issues uh, that have to do with uh, the crisis undermining uh, the peace of a nation which has actually uh, led ab uh, about uh, economic uh, 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 downfall of uh, the country. We cannot actually uh, start to elaborate on the economic implications of what has been happening, but then we want to also continue uh, to analyze uh, uh, like uh, intellectuals who want to actually bring an end, a solution to the problems, why uh, pinpointing areas uh, that need maybe that the government still has uh, lapses in particular areas that can actually bring results to this. And on the other hand, the, uh, uh, the separatists or the, those with the, the different ideologies uh, coming also to compromise all for the benefit of, of the country. And uh, the last question which I forwarded, uh, uh, directed to Mr. Shune, I will be bringing to you. We are talking about strategies, strategies. He talked about uh, similarities, cultural similarities existing between uh, uh, the, the different tribes in Cameroon. And this brings, brings us now to why we have allowed lines of division brought about by our colonial masters to continue to hunt us even in the, the 21st century. How can we uh, change the mindset around all of these things to ensure that we have a Cameroon? Today there is a song of Pan-Africanism and of course seeing Africa as one. Now how can we uh, also bring uh, this ideology in our own country for the benefit of Cameroonians? All that we need is to see that Cameroonians are okay in Cameroon. So what strategies, practical strategies, uh, that it can be long-term or short-term strategies that will eventually uh, uh, change the mindset of people, mm -hmm. especially align, uh, uh, cultural, around cultural lines, dividing the country, and of course, derailing us from the target of ensuring uh, uh, development uh, that will also make Cameroonians be proud to stay in the nation. Clarice, before I answer your question, I, I have said before, and I want to say it again, that each and every one of us, we have the right to our opinion, but we do not have the right to facts. Facts are facts. When Mr. Shone said that the international community was coming to Cameroon because the international community agreed with what the, president, the, the, the government is doing, that's a, uh, a bogus misrepresentation. The international community is coming to Cameroon because they see a problem that the government of the nation is not able to handle, and they are coming in to try to see if they can give some solutions and some ideas on how to handle the situation. Not because they're coming, not because they're coming to Cameroon because they're agreeing with the position of the government. Please, that's a bogus misrepresentation of the international community. And you ask the question: What is the has the international? What does the international community be, be doing? Let us put facts the way they are and let the chips lie where they belong. Number one, we heard about the Swiss talks. What happened to the Swiss talks? You can answer that question when you get back home. We heard about the Canadian talks. What happened to the Canadian talks? You can as well answer that in the beer parlor, wherever you belong. But we do not have to manipulate facts because we have a political agenda that want to uh, send across while people are dying. Number two, he said that the military of the country can protect every Cameroonian. The fact that we are here talking about people, 50 people that have been killed, defeats the same argument that military can protect everybody. Where was the military when these people were being killed? Gentlemen, military is not there to protect every single citizen. Military is there to make, maintain peace. And peace that is obtained through the barrel of the gun is unsustainable, Mr. Shonen. It is the ordinary citizens, when they go about the ordinary activity, they love one another. They want to belong to that community. They have a sense of belonging to that nation. That is what brings peace. It is not the military that maintains peace. 
So to say that the military will protect every person in the Northwest and Southwest, let the military do the job, that is what will make our people die. Because these barbaric monsters will continue to kill our people. You're not going to put every military behind every civilian. You're not going to do that. That is what I said. The, a political solution cannot be solved through the battle of the gun. People need to sit on a table as brothers and sisters and look at the form of state and say, what is this problem that our brothers from Southern Cameroon that joined with the East Cameroon to form a nation, what is this problem that has been aching them right from the time of ST Muna, John Gu Funcha, SCNC, AAC1, AAC2? We need to put those things on the table and discuss them so that the nation can move forward. Number three, I already mentioned, some of you that are in the government do not understand how much the government of Cameroon is spending to buy military weapons and send military to the Northwest and Southwest. They have the Boko Haram in the North that they are fighting. And then you have another war in the Northwest and Southwest. How would people, how would development agenda be brought on the table when you have a military agenda that supersedes a development agenda? These are things that political propaganda variants and then and then. Number three, you ask about economic implication, which I want us to discuss this, and what strategy can be used. Again, the issue here is the form of state. Ladies and gentlemen, let us leave the separatists aside. No agenda of the concern of the people. Leaving the separatists aside, I have said, if you take the ideology, if you take the concerns of the people and bring it to the table and everybody is discussing about it, these separatists will go out of relevance. Go out of The anglo saxon system of bondage, the anglo saxon government is the parliamentary representative form of government. Governors are not elected. We do not know of, we do not know of SDUs. We know of local government areas that are representing the ideals of the people. So when he says that there is no problem, to say that the head of state has done this and therefore there is no marginalization because somebody from the Northwest is a mayor in Litura or somebody, this is, a, this is why we find ourselves where we are found it and this kind of notion and say there's somebody from the Northwest who is a mayor in Douala, therefore there's no marginalization. Does Joseph O.C. being mayor or whatever it is in Douala represent the ideals and the complaints of marginalization by the Anglophones? Is that what your definition of marginalization is all about? So gentlemen, let us understand this. The Africa, we are all Pan-Africanists, but Pan-Africanism is not a fusion of different independent states to form one conglomerate. No, it is a maintenance of these particularities that belong to every country working together, working together like how you have the European Union. France does not cease to exist because the European Union exists. Belgium does not cease to exist because the European Union exists. So Pan-Africanism wants to make sure that all the individual particularities that exist within the Union, everybody is respected with his own peculiarities. From an economic perspective, I have already said, and I will say it again, the government of Cameroon is spending billions on the war in the Northwest and Southwest and the, war, and, and, and the fight against Boko Haram. If you have a budget that is voted and you have between 15 to 30 percent of that budget dedicated to military maintenance of peace through the military, we're not talking about the police because this is something that's supposed to be done by the police. But you have armed forces maintaining peace. That is an internal turmoil that is not sustainable. That's a peace model that is not sustainable. And that is a development strategy that is not sustainable. No economy would develop when you have 30% of the budget dedicated to fighting armed conflict within the country, especially we are talking about a third world country. 
We're not talking about a gigantic United States that can send billions to Israel and to Ukraine and they can survive. We are talking about a country that is struggling under the structural adjustment program that has been imposed on them by the AMF. And then you have them dedicating 30% of their budget into military. That is not sustainable. Number two, decentralization of powers within a central governance system is what is bringing a lot of the problems, not just in Cameroon, but in Africa. They have talked about uh, decentralization and all whatnot. We know that decentralization in Cameroon that was supposed to happen in 1996, it's only on paper. It's on paper. You have to go to Yaoundé to do a little thing. Everything is centralized in the hands of others. When people feel that they do not have a representative governance, there is no development that's going to follow. And that is the problem in Cameroon. And that's the problem in the Northwest and Southwest. He mentioned about you know, development. He mentioned about cultural issues and so on. That is not the problem, gentlemen. That's, ladies and gentlemen, that is not a problem of the Northwest and Southwest. It's not that an Anglophone cannot do anything in the Southwest or a Francophone cannot do anything in the, in the Northwest. That is not it. You're getting it wrong. The problem is government of the people by the people for the people. Autonomous government, let the people handle their own affairs, their own resources, their own governance, their own system, their own educational system, their own representation. It is happening in the United States, it's happening in Canada, it's happening in Scotland, it's happening elsewhere. Why not in Cameroon? That is where the problem is. When you give people the power to handle their own affairs, you are going to see development. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Elijah and Arco. I think we're going to end there for time constraint. But let's just have one word from you uh, before we go, Mr. Shunengwa, regarding uh, this, uh, the way forward. Let's make Cameroon Cameroon. Yes, uh, Larry. The way forward for us to make Cameroon Cameroon is for us to stop people like Mr. Enwaku who are disinforming the people about things that are not true. Yes, I would call him a prophet of doom in the sense that when he says, talks about decentralization, he doesn't master the intrigues of decentralization. I'm talking like a municipal authority that decentralization is a reality in this country now. And thanks to the head of state in whom I continue to say I trust in his clairvoyance, he has brought decentralization and his, as he promised in his 1996 uh, decree. We have a ministry in charge of decentralization and I think uh, uh, decentralization now in Cameroon in the uh, territorial integrities is a reality. The councils are managing everything at the level of the councils. So wherever Mr. Enwako is Staying in Canada, I begin to wonder when he last visited Cameroon and stay in his community for at least six months. Because before you can experience the reality of decentralization in your community, you should be living there for at least six months. You don't just make a sporadic come in and a sporadic <laughs> living, and then you think you can do an appreciation of the advanced level of decentralization that we are enjoying now in this country. And uh, I want to say that uh, we of Africa today, we are putting forward the Pan-Africanist agenda. And we and while putting on that Pan-Africanist agenda, we believe that African problems should be resolved by Africans. And we will not continue to put forward the new colonialist agenda, where we expect that Canadians should hold, they should hold talks in Canada to resolve problems in Cameroon, or they should hold talks in Switzerland to preserve problems in Cameroon because they consider Africans to be the underdogs. I think we have that same intellectual capacity to solve problems, European problems. We have crises in the UK, even in Canada, there's a separatist problem happening now in Canada. They have not invited us to come and help them solve that problem. But I want to tell you that for them to resolve that problem, they need specialists like us in Cameroon to come. But through bridges like you, who give the impression that we are underdogs and they are better off, they cannot come to call us. I want to tell you that we have better specialists in Cameroon, like those who were pre-selected by the head of state to attend the Grand National Dialogue, and those who were pre-selected to work in the various committees that were set up that 
our problems can be solved by us. No nation can live on its own. But when you go to the level where we require them to come also that we sit and talk like equal partners, we are going to sit. But we don't go to Swiss to talk like underdogs who have gone to a master to help them solve their problems. But brother, I know I've been in the West, I've been in the Americas, I've been in Europe all around. I know what we go through there. We, when we come back here, we pretend as if we are, we are, we are bogus. But I'm saying that Africa for Africans, we have that intellectual capacity to build Africa by Africans, and Africans are capable to solve African problems. And we are no longer that other dog, because new colonialism is a weapon of mass destruction against the African people. We will talk with Europeans, we will talk with Americans like equals, and we will solve our problems. Those hoodlums, those barbarians who are hiding in the US and in Europe, and causing mayhem back in Cameroon, sooner than later, the the hand of the law is going to hold them and they're going to answer for the crimes against humanity that they're causing back in this country. And we should be very careful about the statements we make in Mondo Vision because our statements that we make that will go a long way to promote secessionist activities means that we are part and parcel of them. And when time comes, we will answer for our statements. Without much ado, Cameroon is a state of law we are a unity state, we are one and indivisible, and we stand by the Hebrew state for national unity and integration in this nation. I doff my heart to all the families who lost their members in Manfe, and we say that we condemn in very strong terms these acts of, bar of barbarism, and we want to call on all Agrofon Cameroonians living in the Northwest and Southwest regions that they should collaborate with the military of this country so that these hoodlums should be smoked out of their hidings and let peace and unity return to our communities. Because I know my brother where he's talking now, he cannot go back, come to this country and go back to his village. And so I would like that next time when we'll be conversing, he should be able to be here in Cameroon and invite me to his village and let me invite him too to the Bafo Kingdom where we can sit and commune like Anglophone Cameroonians in a state of law that is covered with peace, unity, love and tranquility. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Shunengua. I, uh, I, I know uh, you gentlemen still have a lot to say as far as this topic is concerned, uh, but we have to cut it off already. That butter. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, the great analysis, uh, diverse views with uh, one objective of seeing uh, that uh, the, we uh, have a practical solution to what is uh, actually uh, happening in Cameroon, the Anglophone crisis. How can we uh, stop the act of uh, barbarism? How can we ensure uh, that uh, uh, the civilians will sleep uh, without uh, uh, fear of not seeing the next day because uh, they will be killed gruesomely by uh, uh, people whom we don't uh, actually know? And of course, I think uh, the plight of every Cameroonian is uh, to see uh, that uh, peace returns, like Mr. Elijah said earlier on, no peace, no development, and we can only enjoy the endowment of our country if actually there is peace. So I want to thank you all for your great analysis. I also want to thank you ladies and gentlemen for uh, watching the programs and uh, appreciate uh, the uh, technical crew for ensuring uh, that the program was a success and of course for the extra time given to us to ensure this uh, uh, thought provoking uh, 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 program to go on. Thank you so much and keep trusting the Pan-African television, the cause is to see that we have an African solution to an African problem and we also can have a Cameroon solution to a Cameroon problem. Let's live in peace, of course, for the benefit of all. Thank you and see you some other time. Afrique Média.